Hi, I'm Tori, and today I'm going to be reviewing The Great Hunt by Robert Jordan. This is the second book in the Wheel of Time series, and it was published in 1990. I listened to the audiobook narrated by Michael Crawford and Kate Reading. There's not a lot I can say about this book without going into spoilers, so I will go ahead and leave a link to my review of the first book, and then I'm also making a summary of this book, so I'll leave a link to that as well. And if you want to read this book, go do that, and then come back to hear my opinions. So I thought this book was a lot slower than the first one. The audiobook was about four hours shorter, but it felt so much longer. There just wasn't really enough plot to make it interesting. You know, the book opens with all the characters in that same city they were in when the first book ended, and Rand has been meaning to leave for about a month, but he hasn't gotten around to it yet because he doesn't actually want to cut ties with all the people he cares about, which kind of makes sense. But then as soon as the Omerlin seat got there, it was kind of hilarious because he's trying to hide from her and he thinks he's being so sneaky creeping around this castle and she knows exactly where he is. And the whole thing would be kind of ridiculous if Leandrin hadn't been looking for him and trying to kill him. So it was kind of okay that he was hiding, but it's sort of amazing he evaded her because he is not remotely good at hiding. I did really like during the hiding scenes he bumps into Egwene and this is kind of the only scene they had together in this book. In the previous book they had loads of scenes together and I just felt like they had hardly any chemistry. I was anxious for them to decide not to be in love with each other and move on because I didn't care about them at all. And in this one little scene they had so much more chemistry than in the previous book combined so I really like that. So I was confused. In the previous book, I thought they'd been talking about, oh, he was kind of flirting with Egwene a little bit, and he blushed when she was nearby, and from the way he talked, it sounded like he was just figuring out his feelings. But in this book, it talked like he'd been expecting to marry her for the last decade or something. I don't know what really happened between that book and this book to make his relationship with her go from, oh, I'm flirting with her, and there are very few girls in my village, so I'll probably end up marrying her, to, Oh, I've known that I was going to marry Egwene since I was 10 years old. Maybe if I ever reread the series, I'll pick up on more of that in the first book. I did think it was really interesting to see Egwene's relationship with the Omerlin seat and to find out that they've been planning all of this their whole lives, basically, and they both knew about this prophecy and they've been hunting for Rand since they were young girls and they're kind of conspiring together. The whole dynamic of the Aes Sedai is very interesting because the Omerlin seat is supposed to be completely neutral, but she is very clearly on the blue Aja team. And the red Aja is starting to remind me of Slytherin in Harry Potter. It's like, okay, this is where we put all the evil people. So it's interesting to see how much freedom the red Aja get when they're clearly horrible people, at least all the ones we met are. Though I did think Varen and all the brown Aja are hilarious because they're the ones who are so academic they don't really have much of a concept of things going on in the real world, they're just excited to gain knowledge. And Varen was actually a pretty fun character to watch because like she does have a lot of good traits and stuff and she is more active than some of the other brown Aja, but she is so focused on learning and knowledge that it was just very fun to see her. And I also thought it was hilarious to watch Rand starting out on his journey and the way Moraine and the Amarillin seat were so easily able to manipulate him. They took all of his other clothes and gave him these fancy clothes with like dragons embroidered on them. And he's about as good at resisting being the Dragon Reborn as he is at hiding. So it was kind of funny to watch that. And I was really pleased with how quickly he ended up telling Matt and Perrin that he was the Dragon Reborn. Because watching him try to be horrible to them on purpose to push them away but still decide to spend time with them was just all very tedious and was much better once they knew what was going on. And so then we spent a big chunk of the book chasing after Padon Fane and trying to get the dagger and trying to get the horn, which wasn't overly interesting but was still pretty decently entertaining to listen to until we get to the point where Rand accidentally sucks himself and Loyal and Huron into an alternate dimension which would have been kind of fine. It was a depressing dimension, but there we meet Celine, and I basically hated every scene with Celine in it. Because the book had opened with mentions of this one female forsaken who is so evil and no one knows what happened to her. And then so we meet this strange mysterious woman and right away you know she's evil and it's pretty likely that she's going to be the forsaken. I was kind of hoping as time went on that maybe she wasn't the forsaken, maybe she was just a random manipulative controlling woman, but it seems pretty likely that she is the forsaken. And it was so obvious from the very beginning that she was controlling the Grome who was chasing her. She wasn't even trying to hide it. She was clearly unafraid. She was just kind of standing there saying, 
oh help, the Grom is chasing me, please attack it. And Ran saves her and feels like such a hero. Oh, I saved you, Fan Maiden, from the horrible monster. And then she's just so horrible. I guess she's really, really beautiful, and maybe she gives off some sort of pheromone that makes people's brains shut off. But all three of them, Rand, Loyal, and Huron, were all desperately in love with her and all so eager to please her and do whatever she wants, and she wasn't even nice to them. And then she's trying to get Rand to bring her back through the portal, and he never once stops to think, maybe there are things in this dimension that want to get out that I shouldn't let out, maybe I shouldn't get her out. And she's so obviously manipulating him. She says, oh look, three of the Grom are coming. You can't possibly kill them. We have to get out. And Rand says, I can kill three Grom. And you can almost see her rolling her eyes and say, okay, 20 Grom are coming, or however many it was that were chasing them. And he just let himself be so easily manipulated. I couldn't stand to watch those parts. At least once they got through the portal and made it to the city, she kind of disappeared and just faded in and out, which made the rest of this book nicer because we didn't have to deal with her. But it does mean that she will be back in later books to keep manipulating and controlling Rand, and he'll just keep letting her. And so then Rand, Loyal, and Huron hung out in the city for a really long time, and that got sort of tedious too, until they had to all go run off and save Egwene and the rest of the girls. And that whole thing seemed fairly pointless to me too, because I mean, you got to see the really cool thing with um, Rand transporting the whole army through the stones, which didn't really do anything other than advance his powers. Because it didn't actually end up saving time, it still took him a long time to get there. I'm sure at that point, Padan Fane was wondering where he was and why he hadn't come to rescue them yet. But he raced in there to save them, and then he didn't even actually end up saving them. They saved themselves. Or I guess the kidnapped ones didn't really, because Egwene and Min were the only two that had actually gotten captured, and Nynaeve and Elaine were both still free, and they were able to rescue their friends and all be safe. And it didn't really do anything for the story. Rand got this brief glimpse of Egwene that made him think she needed saving, and somehow that motivated him to join into that battle, and this battle was a lot like the one at the end of the last book. I had a really hard time focusing on it and paying attention, and I couldn't even tell you who they were fighting, really. I know that Matt blew the horn, so now he has an undead army at his beck and call for the rest of his life, which will probably come in handy. And there was this whole thing, they were all fighting, and then Rand fought Baalzaman again. I feel like that'll happen kind of at the end of every book, and hopefully at the end of the last one, Baalzaman will actually be defeated. But it was this whole big metaphoric battle, and I just found myself kind of tuning out and waiting until the end. It wasn't as interesting to me as earlier in the book, watching Rand deal with all of his powers, and learning that the reason that men don't survive when they use magic is because it is this really addictive thing, and it was really interesting to kind of see him. He'd always gone into the void, and in the first book, that didn't really hurt him at all, but in the second book, it was this really consuming addiction, but then he was kind of able to figure out how to use the void without getting the addiction side of it, and I don't know if that's learning to use the magic without having side effects, or if it's just learning to use the void without using magic, I don't know, but that part was entertaining, and I'd like to see more of that instead of all the big epic battle stuff, though I know that is kind of a staple of fantasy books like that, and you kind of have to include it. It's just wasn't my favorite part of the book. And then at the end we had this vision where we've already known that men can see the future, and we've already known that men, Elaine, and Egwene were all going to fall in love with Rand and he'd have to choose between them, and now we've added a fourth one. Now Selene is in there too, though I don't think she's actually in love with Rand. I think that he's going to fall in love with her and she's just going to manipulate him. But I'm starting to wonder, there are all these women who are supposedly going to fall in love with Rand, and Egwene is the only one who makes sense because she already knew him and she was already sort of in love with him, and the other ones have all just gotten these prophecies that they will fall in love with him. And I guess it's a really long series, it makes sense that at some point throughout the series it would naturally happen, he could fall in love with them. But just kind of knowing at the beginning makes it kind of a strange dynamic, and I really hope that they all get multiple love interests too, and it's not just this little harem of women following him around and waiting for the day when they can be in love with him. So there weren't really a lot of things I loved about this book. I liked the first one much more, and I am going to read the next book. I really hope that I enjoy it more than this one. This one just felt like it was a lot of time-killing stuff had to get done to make the plot of the next book happen, and I'm really hoping that the next one is a lot more enjoyable.